that's the number one rule is that it's subjective. It's ever changing. And if somebody wants to go by they, and then two days later wants to go by she, cool. Mm -hmm. Welcome back to Made It Out. Today, I am here with Gray, one of my very good friends, and they are here to talk to us about gender fluidity, which yeah. I'm so excited about because I feel like I have so much to learn. I feel like our audience has so much to learn. So thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Of course. We've, we've come along. I've come a long way <laughs> from my sister telling me that fluidity is a thing I made up in college. Yes. To now it being something that I'm just like. No, this is just the easiest thing I've ever been because yeah. it's, it is just fluid. It's just me. It's just you. Yeah. I love it. Okay. Let's take it back. I want to hear about kind of your family, your life growing up. Mm -hmm. So I'm the youngest of four children. My parents were actually together for a surprisingly long time, but did get divorced when I was like in third grade or something. Um, but he did grow up very conservative mm -hmm. and just honestly a little brainwashed, not on purpose, but just because I was a little kid repeating everything my parents said, I'd be like, it's a civil union, not a marriage. And, <laughs> you know, they have the same rights. They're just not exercising them. And now I'm like, I can picture where I was saying that on my driveway and thinking I was correct. That's wild. And I, I wrote in a book recently that it would take a baptism out West to get out of that. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that's so yeah. true. Is it just, I tell people I'm from Boston, but I feel like I grew up when I came to LA mm. and came to college because I feel like there'd been so much of me that was just like, it just wasn't even around me to question. Mm -hmm. I wasn't like, am I gay? Or do I not feel like a girl? I was just I was constantly tomboy. That just was what it was. My parents thought it was fine. My siblings thought it was fine. Everybody yeah. around me thought it was fine. Like I just was, there was no question. There was no labels. There was no anything until I was maybe like in high school and felt like, oh, I don't feel like those girls. Like mm. they're hot and confident and feminine. And I'm like, <laughs> like really awkward around boys and was interested in them, but could never really figure out how to like feel confident and how to feel like I wanted to be with men. Mm. And I was, but I was never, I never felt right about it, I guess. About being around men or about like being in relationships being with men? Being in relationships with men. Okay. Because I think too, even like just hooking up with guys, it came kind of naturally. It's just like, that's what happened. And it just, you know, it happened and I enjoyed it and that was it. Right. But I would start dating guys and be like, Ugh. it didn't feel like deep, I guess, or intimate to me. When I started dating women, I was like, oh. This just makes, makes sense. sense now. Do you think part of the dynamics with men was because of the gender fluidity? Yeah, definitely. I was never comfortable being feminine and being like the object of a gaze. Mm. That made me run the other way. So once I started to feel a bit more masculine just in energy and then match that with my expression, I felt immediately confident. I felt like, wow. I'm not waiting for somebody to look at me and validate me. And not that women all do that, but I was doing that right. when I was being feminine. Mm -hmm. I was waiting for somebody to validate me. And when I started to dress more masculine and act just myself, mm -hmm. I just realized how much easier it was to just be myself and let that sort of lead the conversation and not just sit in a corner and be like, no one's hit on me yet. What's wrong with me? Yeah, which is really... Tough because I feel like, especially in high school, you're looking outward to be like, okay, what's normal and yeah. what's accepted and what does everybody else think is hot? I was yeah. doing the same thing. Yeah. I, I mean, I was getting like, not in high school, but after high school, I've got like boob jobs and all these surgeries to become really hyper feminine. Mm -hmm. And now I've like reversed all of yeah. them because I'm like, okay, wait, no, that doesn't really feel, yeah, that doesn't feel like me or like how I want to be looked mm -hmm. at. So how did you, did you start to kind of experiment with that in high school? With high school, I think it was more about just like my, I feel like I started to realize a bit more about my fashion sense. Like I grew up super preppy. I was wearing double polos. Yeah. I was wearing, like I was doing funky ties on my Sperry's. Like I wanted <laughs> oh my God, to, Sperry's. I like wanted to be a baseball boy, honestly, like a baseball hockey, but I went to a boarding school in New England. Like I would look to those boys and be like, I don't know if I want to sleep with you or be you. I wanted like the little colored polo hat collection. I wanted the like, you know, the Sperry's with the funky ties. I wanted like the Nike calf socks. Like, 
And I feel like I didn't really realize that until I looked back, until I was dressing like them. I was like, oh my God, I think I wanted to be you. I don't think I wanted to date you. Which is so interesting because I feel like as a more feminine lesbian, I was asking myself that about girls. Yeah. Like, do I want to be like you or do I want to be with you? Yeah. So Sometimes it's, interesting. it's both. Yeah. Justin Bieber, it's both. <laughs> Can't pick. <laughs> both. Yes. So high school was more about, I feel like my expression of self and just like being comfortable with taking up more space as mm -hmm. a human person. And then in college, but honestly, thank God for my roommate and friend, Jenna Brown. This is the only reason I came out because she started dating. A, she was this straight girl from Indiana, started dating the hottest rugby captain who was like six feet tall and like half a shaved head. And I was like, oh, we can do that. <laughs> oh my God. Oh yeah. my God. And I told her like, I'm going to pull a Jenna. I'm going to start dating women. Like I couldn't even say those words out loud, dating women. Right. I made a joke about it. Like I'm going to pull a Jenna. I'm going to do what you did mm. because I didn't even know how to have the language for it. Mm -hmm. But that's again, I think like experimenting with whatever you feel in a safe way is like the only way that it's going to become a part of you or you're going to learn it's really not. Yeah. And I think that even when I first started, when I was first single and gay, I had been in a relationship for four years. We kind of, I feel like I grew into being a gay person with her. Mm -hmm. Didn't know what the fuck I was as a gay person. I was like, what do I wear? Who am I attracted to? What do I want? Mm -hmm. I felt lost because I had kind of like come out and so slyly just been like, I'm dating a girl. And like two months later, dating another girl. <laughs> and then we dated for four years. And then I was like, oh my God. Yeah. What am I? Am I a mask? Am I a, a femme? <laughs> Am I both? And so that's what I kind of like tiptoed. I literally just did a PowerPoint about my journey in to, from straight to gay to I genderless. To this. We'll show you the pictures. You're in a lot. Matilda's in a lot of them. I literally Aww. have a slide that's just like manic, hoogie, depressive, like stage. And it's just me and Matilda like mirror selfies. <laughs> like me with fully chair, like looking frail, man. Like, oh my God, I was so depressed. But that journey is literally just experimentation and finding what felt comfortable. And there was a time where I was still wearing a lot of feminine clothes and feeling good about it. And I love that image, but there was a pivotal moment. I was in a lift back when shared Ubers and lifts were like a thing. Mm -hmm. I took them all the time. I got in one. I was wearing this like sexy little red crop top, with, like tight skinny jeans. Okay, it was a while ago. <laughs> and I'm a millennial. <laughs> and they're like, oh, are you a vegetarian? I turn around thinking, like, they picked me up in Venice. Like, okay, sure, fair question. And I'm like, no. And they go, so you eat meat? And my entire body just like. Oh, my God. They were being awful and being gross. And I just like shrunk into myself, into that front seat. And Ugh. they got out of the car first and the guy got out with them and like gave them a lecture. And then he got back in. He's like, I'm comping your ride. I'm so sorry. Like, do you need anything? And oh my God, it's making me emotional. Um, and he was so sweet. And that I feel like I stopped dressing feminine. I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I hate this. Oh my God. I haven't, I feel like I haven't told that story or known that that was a pivotal moment Ugh. since that happened. Yeah. And I started dressing really mask after that. Wow. I don't even have my period or anything. This oh, is just, uh, <laughs> no, it's, I mean, that's tough. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like I went on this huge pendulum. Like, I don't want to be feminine. Don't look at me. Don't, you know, I have a nice ass. Don't look at it unless you're invited. Like, mm -hmm. absolutely not. Um, and it took, I feel like then eventually dating a non-binary person where I got to be all those parts of myself in a really safe way. Mm. And I get compliments on my butt and my feminine figure, you know, like I could wear like a high waisted bathing suit and like get a compliment and be like, Oh, okay. I'm allowed to love this and I'm allowed to make it mine. Mm -hmm. As I think, especially with my high school experience of feeling like I was de so dependent and defined by other people's validation and gazes yeah, that an experience like that told me exactly why I should not do it because mm -hmm. I just felt so susceptible to a, another person's definition of me right. in that moment. And so then I, I just didn't know how to build up my own. Yeah. Until probably a year ago. I mean, I think that's like a a very normal trajectory and probably a very normal queer trajectory because you're like kind of denying a part of yourself or turning away from a part of yourself yeah. and you you can't give yourself that validation. So you are seeking it yeah. from anywhere else and kind of tracking like, okay, what's yeah. okay, what's okay, what's okay. Yeah. And I think it does take years and years and years to 
overcome that and really feel yeah. comfortable in, in that. Yeah. So the swing to the other side to dressing really mask, did it start to like, it started to level out when you dated someone that was non-binary? I feel like for me, it was actually in my last relationship where I was just comfortable as whoever I was, you know? Okay. Um, I feel like maybe we weren't as open, like sexually in the sense of, I wasn't even seeking validation as like a feminine being. Okay. I wasn't even being open to that part of me. I wasn't looking for that. I feel like we kind of did the gay thing where like I was kind of filling a masculine role and she was kind of filling the feminine role. Okay. And I didn't ask any questions about that. It wasn't something I was seeking. Like it wasn't even on my mind mm -hmm. because it's just a very, that happens a lot. But I feel like that's when I started to kind of come into my own more about like fashion sense, you know, like I don't need to wear big baggy things. I can wear tightly fitted things. Like I feel like I started to do like the Jacob Elordi, like, okay, I'm kind of kind of masculine, but there's feminine pieces, you know? Okay. And still maybe kind of wearing crop tops, but with like dress pants and, you know, boots or something. So yes. just kind of finding my own, again, I feel like it, it tends to start with that external expression mm -hmm. that just feels right and comfortable. And I think that was massive for me, like becoming more of a genderless person. And I even just would randomly have people come up to me and be like, I just see you exploring that. So openly and honestly, and you know, I want to do that. I want to do more of that. I think I'm going to start going by they and it would just be like, yeah, what do you need? Do you need anything? You need me to start calling oh, you a new name? Like, I love that. because I had friends who did that for me. I was really scared when I moved to LA and I was like, you know, I think it's going to be my writing name, gray. And two of my best friends were like, let's fucking do it. And they would mess up all the time. We would all mess up all the time. I couldn't say gray talking about myself for weeks. Mm. It felt so uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but it just happened. That's like when I started to meet all my friends and I started to build a home here. I was like, nobody knows this isn't my real name. Mm. And it was euphoric. Wow. And that's a big part of wanting to change it. Like legally now I'm just waiting on the papers, but like I couldn't go somewhere with my credit card. I'd be like, Oh God, what if they find me out? Like it just felt like a, a falsity I was right. carrying around. Right. Because, yeah, finding the finding the name, finding the love for yourself, finding the, like, I feel like I am somebody that now somebody could go to and be like, I'm struggling with this. Mm -hmm. Or I'm confused. Or, oh, guess what? I kind of went too far and I maybe take it back now. I want to yeah. be more feminine now. And it's like, that's the number one rule is that it's subjective. It's ever changing. And... If somebody wants to go by they and then two days later wants to go by she, cool. Yes. Do your thing. So we've, we're talking, well, we've talked a lot about outward expression of gender, but not a lot about the journey with the identity. Mm -hmm. So can you kind of explain the difference between the two and kind of how you got to the identity portion and figuring that out? Yeah. I think I used the external expression, things like fashion, things like calling myself like mask. Um, I, I feel like I almost use those a bit as a crutch because they're acceptable mm. to so many people. They're even acceptable to conservative people, you know, like my parents, like mm. they know I'm gay. They know I would wear a tux to a wedding. They know that I'm going to bring home probably not a cis man. Nothing, mm -hmm. you know, maybe <laughs> that would really shock them. <laughs> that would shock them more honestly <laughs> than anything else. But they don't know I identify as non-binary, genderless. They don't know I'm technically changing my gender with the state of California. Mm. That feels vulnerable to me. That feels like a part that I am still learning to announce and, and feel loved by myself and other people with. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the internal expression is the one that takes a longer time because it is like, it's raw. And it's me realizing, oh, I've been this way the whole time. And I've been bucking with the external expression to try to make sense of what felt in here, what didn't make sense on the outside. Mm -hmm. Like I was always a tomboy. I was always very athletic and sporty. I love to fix things. I love to be a dad. I love to be like my dad. I can't imagine telling my dad something about my gender and him being like, disappointed that like, you know, something like, I think of walking me down the aisle, I'm like, you couldn't have imagined walking me down the aisle 
in a big white dress. There's no way you thought of that. Right. That's a disservice to both of us. You know, <laughs> like you taught me how to complain about engineers and like how to drive the boat and like how to open beer bottles with each other. Like, right. A lot of people grow up and they see their parents as like, this is the parent I am. This is the parent I'm seeking as like a partner. I looked at my dad as the kind of partner I would want to be. Mm-hmm. not like the man that I wanted to attract. Mm-hmm. And I see that every time I like turn into him, you know, like get up early, make sure you have your stuff, make sure you have your, your breakfast. It's making me emotional. Cause Aww. it's like, I don't think he knows that, but it's, it's deep within me. Yeah. And I feel like that ties into the identity because it's mm-hmm. just comfortable for me to be somebody who takes care of somebody and somebody who like, yeah, I think for me that just has always fit with more of a masculine role Mm -hmm. in life in relationships and finding when all of those things had harmony was the most beautiful experience like I started writing without pronouns I I didn't want anybody to ever feel like loving a man or woman or non-binary person was going to define them connecting with my writing Mm. and I think that was when it really for me I was like whoa I can't even call this like gay poetry anymore I don't even know if this is LGBT writing (laughs) But I'm an LGBT author. (laughs) And in my second book, I had this whole blurb, like inclusivity is not queer theory. This isn't something that we're trying to brainwash you with and ruin your life and your tradition with. All I'm trying to do is make room for more people. Mm. And that is so massively important to me. And that's why I think it's important for me to be brave enough to have the internal questions and answer them Mm -hmm. out loud and be confused and say, yeah, I'm fucking non-binary and I'm, and I'm genderless and I'm going to change my name and I'm going to change my gender. Mm -hmm. And then maybe in two years, if that freaks me out, I won't be anymore. You know, like I can't speak for everybody I know that is non-binary or trans or curious or fluid. It is just such a personal journey. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, yeah, for me, my, my internal journey will always be going on. Mm -hmm. But I found real harmony when I started to just admit, you know what, it's not just a writing pseudonym or it's not just a writing name. It's not just because I don't like my birth name. It's because I feel different. Mm. And I want to be honest about that. And I want that to be a part of me that we're all proud of. You know, I don't want it to be a thing that's like on the ballot. I want it to be just who I am. It makes it more and more important, I think, to create a space where this is just as different as changing your hair color for some people. Right. And for some people, it's the difference between their life and, right. and, and dying. I have a question. What does genderlessness mean to you? I feel like it's a made up word, but I love to identify as genderless. Mm -hmm. And that to me is like, I don't have a label. I don't have anything in in the queer community, even with pronouns. Like you can call me whatever you want. I've had good friends of mine accidentally call me he in conversation to other people. (laughs) Roll with it, you know, (laughs) whatever whatever you're feeling, like it does not affect me. Whereas if a straight person's like, Hey lady, I'm like, what the you do not get me. Like, please stop. Mm. Don't call me queen. Don't hey girl me. (laughs) Unless it's a gay thing. We can gay thing, hey girl, you know? But yeah. we can't straight thing, hey girl. It's yes. very different. <laughs> um, and even like, I'm a mask looking person. I'm so extremely soft. I still have a lot of feminine energy in me. And like, people who date me know that, you know? It's like, I'm very much switchy in mm-hmm. everything that I do. I'm just fluid. And I feel like the only way that you start to live that and allow other people to live that is just by doing it, especially when it's hard and like allowing yourself that, that patience, because I think we could all, even I've misgendered people who I've known are non-binary for a long time. Mm -hmm. I'm like, fuck, I hate that. If if anybody's going to fuck it up, it shouldn't be me, you know, like (laughs) I hate that, but you just, you roll with it and you allow to know that there's been literally thousands and thousands and thousands of years of people being put into boxes. Like we are on we're a new frontier yeah. of even that being an option for people right. to not have a gender. Like that is so fucking cool. Yeah. But sometimes our history is going to be working against us. And, yes. you know, it's not even like we all started learning this when we were one. I started learning this when I was 20 years old. Mm-hmm. So it's it can be hard, but I feel like the only way that anybody is ever going to get through the black and white thinking 
with gender, with emotions, with other people. It's just by doing it. Yeah. I will say I'm privileged in this. To me, in over the years and being in such a safe queer community, gender to me has become almost like an accessory. And I know people who put a lot of it on and I know people like me who want to rip it off and hide it in the closet. <laughs> I don't want it. I want it to, I want to be a clean slate. <laughs> um, so for me, I think genderlessness and why I like to use that word and that description is because I like the clean slate. I like to know that I can pick up anything off the shelf and I can wear a bag this day. I can wear my, I can wear a purse this day. Um, and it almost for me gives me that allowance to live in that gray area mm. and to not have to tell you this is who I am. This is what you can expect. Yeah. Um, because I also think even like in dating, sometimes I don't, I don't know who I'm attracted to or what I want out of it down the line. I just like, I'm a very day to day person and I also don't want to give anybody the wrong impression. Mm. You know, I don't want to show up as this hulking mask lover and then <laughs> Two days later, be like, I'm crying about my relationship with my dad. Like, why aren't you holding me? <laughs> Which in the queer community, I think people expect that of masks more than more than they know. OK, they like think it's some big reveal that they're soft. But like we want to be held. But I feel like for me saying I'm genderless is like, yeah, you have no idea. I have no idea from one day to the next. Right. Like you might get an ass pick. You might get a pick of something in my gray sweatpants, you know, like. <laughs> You never know. Yeah. I never know. I'm going to fly by the seat of my pants. And I feel like that is what has allowed me to now feel safe and confident and feel like I even have any right to create a space. Yeah. Because that's all I want. I want more people. I want my nephews to be like, <laughs> they're growing up in Florida. So I can only imagine what they say with their friends. Right. You know, but I at least imagine a world where they say something shady. I'm like, hey, that's me. Right. Okay. Enough with that. Right. That's me. Look at me. That's what I've been working on most of this year and with the stuff I'm writing and the book I'm writing. And I'm like, I don't even have to come out. I'm just going to tell them, hey, this is kind of what's going on. And literally nothing has changed. Yeah. I don't want to come out. I don't want to make it a big thing. Yeah. I just want to tell you, hey, you know somebody like that. Mm. It's me. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of my poetry has been working out me asking to take up space in people's lives and me asking to be loved. And... That's why I'm very excited about my new book because it's like, no, here I am. Yeah. Here I am. And I, I hope that people find themselves in all of those stories because it's a transition from like when things are going really well, when things are not going well, when you're really sad, when mm -hmm. you're thinking too much about the future, you're just obsessed with it. You're like, oh, I want that. I just want us to be there Yeah. without all the middle ground issues. Yeah. <laughs> Getting there is hard. So you said that your parents are really conservative. What does that look like now that you're really comfortable with yourself? Is there tension? I have the relationship I want to with my family and my parents. And I feel like we all kind of beat around the bush about some things. And there's just been some tension. Like the Trump election was pretty hard. My it, Some of my family had like a champagne bottle with his name on it. Mm. There's a MAGA hat on the deer in the hallway I go home and I hide it. It's fun. It's fun. The game. My dad's like, where's that hat? I'm like, you know where the fuck it is. And I think it was really hard because throughout, I think the first Trump election was the first of its kind for me as an adult and as a queer person. Mm. And I felt so betrayed personally. And I still get upset because I know who my family votes for. And I think a lot of queer kids and a lot of people who aren't even queer, but just angry for us and, and allies and just liberals in general, that vote to them represents like it represents a betrayal. And especially now with what's on the ballot, there's trans rights, there's abortion rights, there's women's rights mm -hmm. it had nothing to do with being gay. And people are just losing autonomy over their bodies and their identities and their health care. And it feels like a personal attack. Mm -hmm. And I think the only thing that has allowed me to, survive without crying every time I think about my family is knowing that in their world, it does not mean that mm. to me, it feels like a betrayal to them. It feels like a fucking vote. Mm. And I have to realize that we're speaking completely different languages in order to 
salvage any bit of that relationship. Mm -hmm. Because if I was waiting on them to change and waiting for them to denounce all of these things that I'm so vehemently against, I would be waiting a long time and I would be full of bitterness Mm -hmm. and rage. And my family, I'm so privileged that despite that inconsistency in our lives and huge imbalance and something that I wish I could take so personally and just argue until I'm blue in the face and they let me, they just don't change after. (laughs) Right. But at the end of the day, I am privileged that they love me Mm -hmm. and that there is no fear about me. I I just haven't told them about my gender identity and journey, but I could. Mm -hmm. And they might be like, you know, stiffen up and be like, I have to call you gray. What? Like, what is that? What do you mean? What do you mean you don't feel like a girl? It's not a big deal. You're just a girl. And I'm like, it's different for me. But knowing that you love me regardless, you're not going to just abandon me as your kid. And that's where I found my relationship with them Mm. because they love me no matter what we have to fight about or what I have to shut up about at Christmas. (laughs) And I think there's also a time and place to like argue and yeah throw the book down. I'm like, I am an intellectual. I will argue with you about this. (laughs) Like there are some things I cannot let slide, you know, or like times where I like to have a a healthy discourse, but yeah, mom, I appreciate your intense belief in God, but can you please understand that God and Jesus and church made me feel terrible about who I was. Mm -hmm. So we're now in a place where we can have discourse like that and it's peaceful and it, actually is really full of love despite the little voice in my head going fuck right why can't you just think like me yeah but I think that's a human urgency and we will always have that about people who are different in a way that feels hurtful Mm -hmm. but I think I'm committed to at least allowing more difference in my life and my relationships because I wouldn't be where I am if people didn't allow for Mm. difference that is where change is made I really do believe that people who um, are willing to go on the journey with people. It's psychological fact that if somebody is told from the start of their opinion, if somebody's just told you're wrong, they're, they're not listening to you. Right. They have to be coddled. Right. It doesn't matter if it's a white straight man. (laughs) It doesn't matter who it is. They have to be coddled with that first sentence I see where you're coming from. Maybe Mm. not even that. Maybe you don't even have that because it's a shitty thing that they just said. But think about me as a a middle schooler going off about civil unions and marriages and I didn't know anything. Right. And I was the same. I would wonder, I'm like, if lesbians are into women, why do they date women who look like men? Mm. I would ask that question as like a 14 year old. Mm -hmm. And then when I became a lesbian who looked like a man, (laughs) I went, Whoa. Whoa. It's because it's like a man, but he's not a man. (laughs) He's like really sweet and safe. And you don't have to, you know, there's a lot of trauma that comes with intimacy, especially with heterosexual couples. And like a lot of women don't feel safe around men. Yeah. But they want a lot of those same aspects of a man. And I like, I never had understanding of that. Right. So me saying to God, little me, I would hold and swaddle and like, we would have a great time. Right. Teenage me, (laughs) slap that bitch around. (laughs) Like, how about you shut the fuck up? You don't know what you're talking about. You're making a lot of judgments and you have no idea where these people are coming from, what they're experiencing on a daily basis. Like you need to leave room for that difference. Mm -hmm. And then you need to find your own opinions. And I think everybody's going to have their opinions, but I think what we need to control is our judgments. Yeah. And acting on those. Beautifully said. So where are you at today? So I am turning 30 in like a week. I am releasing my third poetry book, which I've got to say is the best one yet. And it comes out on your birthday. It comes out on April 2nd. Also day that this releases. Ah. So go buy the book. Full circle. It's called Restless Baby and I am Restless Baby. Ah, so it's very much a journey of myself the past couple years and so I'm also waiting on the official documents that confirm my name change so I legally changed my name to Gray um at the end of last year and 
in order to avoid it being any sort of like public record. Normally you have to put it in the newspaper. You have to go to a judge and have somebody say, yes, you can change your name. And I think those are in place for like legal security, like people who are trying to run away from things. Right. But for me, I'm trying to run away from being named that name. Right. So I'm like, <laughs> I don't want anybody to know that. Like, I don't want right. somebody to Google my book and then be like, change their name. And I'm like, oh, fuck. like that's embarrassing mm. to me. I have shame around that Aww. about like that this isn't my birth name only because it's such a like gender euphoric moment for me to be called gray. Mm. And I, in order to avoid all of the public hearing stuff, I also opted to change my gender legally. Got so it. it's a confusing thing because the government isn't quite caught up to queer theory. So okay. the government says, are you male, female, or non-binary? And I'm like, well, I'm a female. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I have so much pride in that. But I'm not a woman. Mm. And that's where it gets dicey for people like my family, people who, you know, aren't used to this kind of conversation, they're like, what the fuck is the difference? You know, right. be a woman who, who acts differently. And I'm like, nah, because when you call me a woman, societally, historically, you are expecting so many things that I am not willing to provide. Ah, yeah. So for me, it was worth it to kind of weirdly accept, okay, I'm technically not a female on mm. court documents. I'll say that I'm non-binary. Wow. Um, but yeah, for me, it's it's that important that I'm willing to denounce being a female mm. politically <laughs> 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 um, so that I don't have to be a woman. Right. And that feels freeing. The word makes me feel uncomfortable. Like, but I'm also not a man. Right. I just, I like, I like just existing. I like being gray. Congratulations. That's Thank huge. you. Thank I love you. it. Yeah. Our section what are you working on in therapy? Okay, well, I think we've touched on a few things <laughs> that I will work on in my next therapy session. <laughs> but what I was recently working on was to get back out and start dating oh. before I know someone very yes. well. Because I think, yeah, that's like my comfort is waiting until I have a connection. I love to meet people organically and then be like, you're great. Let's go on a date. Let's, mm -hmm. you know, let's spice this up. But for me, I think it'll be very important to exercise my communication muscles, exercise, you know, flirtation again. God, I was trying to flirt with somebody the other night and it felt like auditioning for improv. I was just like, yes, oh. uh, I, I got to keep this going. I can't, I'm sweating I can't lose it. Like, I just got to <laughs> keep the conversation alive. And then it's like, why am I talking about Batgammon Club? Like, I've been once. <laughs> so embarrassing I'm like oh my god you thought I was a suave mask I'm blowing it I'm blowing it <laughs> so I have to destigmatize dating for myself got it and I have to just like turn on the Carrie Bradshaw and do it embrace and maybe hate it and maybe love it I can't wait to hear about the journey <laughs> I'm just like I don't even know if I'm looking for my big because fuck that yeah no <laughs> maybe I'm looking for my Aiden because I would not let him go <laughs> Okay. I think I'm Aiden, honestly. I'm the one who gets fucked. Oh, God. I'm the one who gets dumped, and then you fall in love with me again, and then I get dumped again. Oh, God. We're changing that. We're I rewriting I watched history. season two of Just Like That, so I think they end up together, maybe. So there's hope for me, after all. There I is. Think, that I will, I will wind up with a wife who appreciates that I am a soft cowboy. You absolutely will. Yeah. I'm, I'm writing it in my journal. Okay, perfect. <laughs> I know technically you can't manifest for other people, but maybe just throw me a bone. <laughs> You haul, you ghost. Okay. They have a pet snake. <gasps> no! What the fuck, you guys? I that, know. No, that's my biggest fear. I. Oh my god. Oh no! Absolutely, you ghost. That no. was visceral. <laughs> it's a. I'm picturing them around me right now. It's a full phobia. Oh my god. I can't handle it. Reptiles, not really no. my thing. And because the problem is, if they have a pet snake and they. Ugh. <laughs> If they're like, no, I love them. Like, please. Sure, I, sure. I'll hold space for you, but I'm not getting anywhere near that thing. Yeah. Like what if it's, oh my God, like, mm, you know, those no, people who no, like sleep no. in the bed with their snake. <laughs> that's my, that's my fear. That's my intrusive thought. Me falling asleep. And I picture, I picture them around me. You can never live in Texas. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. It's like, I can't put my feet on the ground. I can't even think about going to Australia. Like I know. Oh, they're that bad there. I didn't even know that. They're not even that bad. I just know they exist. Oh, okay. And they're <laughs> deadly. And like I had a studio in Melbourne and people would say like, oh, do you, would you ever want to go there? And I'm like, no. 
there are snakes on the outskirts. I'm not going anywhere. No, that's my biggest phobia. Like, do you I, feel that way about any other like rep- are turtles reptiles? So turtles have started to freak me out because just their face. Like, I'll see a video. I really don't know where this phobia came from. Like, I tarot readers have been like, no, I don't think it's like past life. I think it's like deeper and you know, oh. they'll get into it with me and I'm like tell me more oh my god one of them told me it's it's more about like a truth like a, a serpents often represent a truth that you're either not facing mm. or you're afraid of <laughs> got lots of those um <laughs> but I like as a kid I had no problem with it like I had little garden snakes like wrap around my legs like I lived in New England like it was no big deal no biggie I would go to zoos and like hold them like no fear somewhere along the lines it's just like oh my god no I, I, like we I went to, to even, this. even, I love otters, but the more I've seen videos and documentaries about otters, they're like massive rodents and they're just wet <laughs> and I can't handle that. I, I just like, Whoa, no, I want their little face. I want them upside down, opening up a sea urchin. But when I see them like slithering, I get really freaked out. You don't out. like the slither. Whoa, no, I don't like the slither. Yeah. This feels like a therapy conversation. Oh yeah. <laughs> they just, <laughs> Lana, this is next Friday. This is next Friday. No more talking about dating. Okay, we're going to talk about snakes. snakes. <laughs> okay, this one, they use your toothbrush the first time they stay at your house. I feel like here's the thing. I've had partners who have tried to tell me how fucking weird that is. I feel like four years ago, I would have been like, whatever, it's a toothbrush. Uh huh. But I think first night ever at my house, that feels uncomfortable. First night ever. Okay, what it's about if like, you're in a very committed, serious yeah. relationship where you own really a business, support, dogs, I cars, I really support homes. you in this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this is a fight in my house. Yeah, <laughs> because here's the thing. I understand both sides. Like the logic that like, that is such an intimate part of me. Why would you make it yours <laughs> and give me yours? Like we kiss, we share fluids. I don't lick your teeth, you know? Like I don't, I don't brush your tongue. With mine. Okay, but at the same time, we kiss, we share fluids. Yeah. Why can't I use your toothbrush? And because here, so that's like the, I get that side. But the other side is, I'm washing the toothbrush off <laughs> after. You know, it's like we share spoons. Those get washed. Like, if I brush my teeth and then, I don't know, clean the toothbrush. It's like, it's just bristles at that point, you know? It's like sharing a broom. Okay, to be fair, so, I'm not washing it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just rinse it, you know? It's like... You don't have to put it in barbicide, but like, I still think that it's, it's okay when you're in a committed relationship, especially even like, yeah, but I think a lot of people have gotten in the habits of having some extra toothbrushes around just in case. So I feel like you call you ghost is just mine and Matilde's way of passively aggressively <laughs> working out. Like, <laughs> like okay, how, how bad normal? would this be? Hmm? <laughs> would you dump them or marry them? Don't answer incorrectly. This is my question. This is the thing I did. Oh my God. Great. Thank you so much for being Thank here. You. I love talking to you. I love talking to you. Cheers to what do you got? <gasps> Honestly, for the first time in my life, cheers to me. <gasps> cheers because to I'm you. turning 30 and I always love making things about other people, but I'm gonna take like a day. To make it about me. Good for you. Cheers to you. Love you. you. Thank y'all for listening to today's episode. As always, help us spread the gay agenda by writing an Apple review, rating us on Spotify, and sharing it with everyone you've ever met. You can find today's guest at Restless Baby Gray, our show at Made It Out Podcast, and me at Mal Glowing. Made It Out is produced and edited by Matilde Jordan and worked on solely by lesbians. I wish I could tell the little version of me, you will make it out. <laughs>